Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. I decided that I'd focused on 211 dosing, which is relatively new and new to the most recent CDC guidelines. So my disclosures, we are going to talk about things that are not currently FDA approved because as oral prep, only FTC TDF, which is brand name Truvada, and FTC TAF, brand name Descovy, are approved, and they are only approved for use as daily prep and in not all populations. So we're going to talk about other things. I know we've talked about uh, 2 one one dosing before. I just want to review the data as it is. I use this talk as an opportunity to look and see what I could find about what's happened since the randomized clinical trial and open label extensions and talk about real world effectiveness, adherence and adherence challenges. A little bit about why people choose 211 because people are choosing 211 and other dosing and then to talk about the prescribing and how to do it and how to do it well. So why am I talking about this and what should we be using as our terminology? It's unfortunate that I think the group that does prep work hasn't sort of solidified what it should be called. I think that most of our clients, our patients are using 211, but you can also find it called event-based dosing or on-demand dosing or coital doicing. There are lots of terminology, which so as you look through the literature, you unfortunately have to go through all of these things in order to find everything. So as I just mentioned, when we reviewed this most recent guidelines from the CDC, that they now include an endorsement of 211. This is their language. So clinicians may choose to prescribe FTDF, again, that's brand named Truvada only, off-label using 2-1-1 dosing for adult men who have sex with men who have sex less than once per week and can anticipate sex. They are the last of the large bodies to endorse 2-1-1 dosing. You may or may not remember that the IAS USA guidelines, which came out a couple years ago, came out in strong support for it, again, only for men who have sex with men and only for the FTDF. There is no, there are no data around with um, FTCTF. And I'm gonna get consistent about my F and FTCs as I hopefully move forward in this. And WHO from a couple of years ago, again, same thing, 2019 supported it. And it is approved for use outside of the United States. So just to go back to what are the data supporting these statements, most of the data came from this one randomized clinical trial. Um, I tend to call it IPERGAY. I know others call it EPERGAY, and I went into the pronunciation. So IPERGAY actually stands for an intervention. So it should be EPERGAY, but I don't think anybody's going to do that. So I'm intrigued what the IPERGAY researchers actually, how they call it. So it's an intermittent dosing strategy where you can see where the 2-1-1 come from. So in the strategy, people were randomized to take two FTDF tablets at least two hours and up to 24 hours before sex, one tablet 24 hours later, and one tablet 24 hours after that, after the intake, not after the, um, the exposure. And if people continue to have repeat exposures, they would continue to take daily dosing after that. The key is those two pills two to 24 hours before. And in the modified intention to treat analysis, this was statistically significant. There was an 86% relative reduction in the risk of HIV acquisition in this trial. It's modified intent to treat because as with most of the other randomized clinical trials in this era, they were doing the initial screening with oral fluid HIV tests, and they excluded anyone in the modified intent to treat analysis who was truly HIV infected at the time of starting PrEP, because of course, PrEP couldn't prevent those infections. So 86% relative risk reduction in the randomized clinical trial. But what we know in all, again, all of these randomized clinical trials is that when they went into open label extension, that the impact of PrEP was greater because when people were in the randomized blinded clinical trial, they weren't aware that PrEP was effective at preventing. And so adherence was often not as good as in the open label extensions when people knew that they were taking a medicine that actually worked to prevent HIV. 
And so comparing the open label extension, you can see the incidence per 100 person years is 0.19 compared to the 6.6 .6 in the placebo group from the randomized clinical trial. And that estimates a relative risk reduction of 97%. So highly effective at preventing HIV. And one of the things that came out, as you probably remember, is that the frequency of sex in this population, that on average, the men who were, and I believe that this trial also include a small number of um, transgender women, but the folks who were in this trial had frequent sex so that it was assumed that they were effectively taking daily dosing. And so there was a sub-analysis that's now been published looking at the subset of participants who had sets of time periods where they had infrequent sex, and they compared that to placebo. And again, you can see that there is a benefit, again, small numbers wide confidence interval of protection of this dosing strategy in individuals who were reported to have infrequent sexual exposures. Lots of caveats with this analysis, which we can talk about. They only looked at certain time periods and there may be bleed over in terms of the infections and the diagnoses. But in general, the conclusion, and I think most people support that, is on-demand PrEP is an adequate alternative to daily PrEP for men who have sex with men who have high risk but infrequent exposures. And then the one other thing that I'll talk about in this data, and I haven't seen this published yet, is looking at the coverage. And so whether or not people were actually doing 2-1-1 dosing appropriately around the time that they had their exposures. Now, there are lots of ways that you can ask people about their sexual exposures in the past. People can keep diaries, uh, things like that. And there are lots of ways that we can ask people about their medicine taking, a lot of which is subject to lots of different biases. So this is the probably the best way to look at uh, whether or not doses happened around the same time. So they had MEMS subcaps. MEMS are the caps that go on top of the bottle and they can record the opening of your pill bottle. And this was done in a subset of participants who were also keeping diary for their sexual exposures. And again, this is not surprising that when they looked back and said, what proportion, if you look at these uh, bars here, are receptive anal intercourse without a condom here, what proportion of those sexual exposures were covered adequately by the PrEP, that individuals who were using PrEP daily, higher proportion of those were covered by their PrEP compared to, if you look over here, the proportion of 2-1-1 dosing that covered the sexual exposures. So, and they defined it as, I think, full as at least one dose before and at least one dose after. Partial coverage was either one of those and none was no um, pills taken around the time of the sexual exposure. And I see the comment in the chat about generic, and I would speak to generic in the same way that I would speak about brand name Truvada, if that's the question. So it could be generic Truvada, generic FTDF could be used in exactly the same way. This is the data from the randomized clinical trial. And so what exists since then? And there's actually not a large amount of data that I could find, most of which is not uh, obviously going to be controlled, but it's really describing the populations of patients who have been doing this since PrEP became approved because people are doing this. So the first that I have above is data from Kaiser in which they had not quite 300 cisgender men of sex with men and they observed no infections, again, small numbers. Similarly, in Europe where 2-1-1 dosing is more common and there they are using ED, event-driven PrEP, as how they're referring to this strategy, that they had a, about twice the number of men, about a quarter who are choosing 2-1-1. But I think the thing that we're seeing is that that people go back and forth. And I think this is one of the things as we think about how to prescribe 2-1-1 dosing is that people will go back and forth on this. And we can talk about that in a second. In that Belgium and uh, Netherlands study, there were two infections. They were in the daily PrEP group. They were presumably folks who were not actually uh, taking their PrEP. There were none in the event-driven PrEP group. We know failures are going to happen. Failures happen with daily PrEP. We know that in both cases, they're underreported because people often don't do all of the investigations needed to confirm that this was truly someone who was on PrEP. It's even harder 
to prove a true failure of two-on-one prep because, again, it's intended to be intermittent. So you may have gotten infected a month ago, not taken prep because you haven't had sex in the last month, and there might not be any way to assess whether or not you had adequate levels at the time of the exposure. There has been a failure reported. Someone came out as saying, hey, I did uh, 2 one one dosing right, and I had a positive test, but there's no way to verify that, and it's never been published. Um, the question of, you know, what I always tell people is, you know, even if you are thinking about this, people are more likely to be protected if they're taking it every day and they're consistent about taking it every day. Just because 2 one one is dosing is harder for the average person. And based on that hypergay data, that suggests that uh, you'll get better coverage with daily. So I found three studies that looked at this, all of which is self-reported. The AMP prep, which was, again, uh, Amsterdam that people reported that they were consistently correct most of the time. And interestingly, they were doing two-on-one differently. I guess this isn't surprising based on who their partners were. So steady partners, they were less likely to do two-on-one dosing compared to casual partners where they were reported that they were better about um, doing two-on-one dosing around the time. The Hong Kong study that I cite there suggests that um, people self-reported perfect or near-perfect coverage regardless of whether they are doing uh, daily and two-on-one dosing. This may be true. This may be uh, due to self-report biases. And then on the other hand, this report from West Africa suggests optimal adherence was significantly worse among individuals who chose two-on-one. So again, I don't think any of this is really surprising. I think we have to do better counseling about how to do two-on-one for people who are going to choose it. And I don't particularly recommend it for everyone. I would prefer, I have a preference for, uh, for daily dosing just because I think it's easier for the average person. There are a number of data that are coming out around what makes two-on-one dosing harder for some people. Um, again, not surprising that the factors associated with condomless sex that was not protected by PrEP in the iPergit open label extension was depression, alcohol, and having more frequent sex acts. Camp and Seberry, who did a national survey in the U.S. of cisgender men who have sex with men who reported doing two-on-one dosing at least once. And these are uh, people reported about any problems they might have had. And again, not surprising, almost half of the people who were doing two-on-one reported that they had had some problem because they had unplanned encounters About a quarter said they had problems remembering the follow-up dosing, and then a quarter said they had problems getting it prescribed because their providers didn't know about it. People choose 2-1-1 dosing because they're having infrequent sexual encounters. This is appropriate. They want to take fewer pills. They want to have less cost and desire to reduce side effects. Although one of the things that we'll talk about is that many of the side effects, especially startup side effects, may be similar whether or not you're doing 2-1-1 or just starting daily dosing. So people may have repeated startup symptoms if they're doing repeated 2-1-1 dosing. So these are recommendations from our guidelines. So if you are going to prescribe, it is recommended that it is for cisgender men of sex with men only, only to use FTDF, which is brand name Truvado, though I mentioned earlier that you could use generic just as well. People um, need to be screened and not have active hepatitis B infection. And so there's concern with starting and stopping PrEP that someone who has active hepatitis B, meaning they're hepatitis B surface antigen positive, that if you start and stop, you may be suppressing their uh, hepatitis B and then um, stopping may result in a flare. So hepatitis B, active hepatitis B infection is not a contraindication to PrEP but it is a contraindication to 2-1-1 PrEP. The recommendation is to prescribe 30 days, written as daily dosing and no refills. And it's written as daily dosing, and perhaps one of our pharmacy colleagues can chime in at during when we have questions. Um, it's my understanding is that that's the only way to get insurance reimbursement is to write it as daily and not as a PRN. The recommendation is still to do quarterly visits, although if someone is having so their sex is so infrequent that they haven't had sex in the last, say, six months, you could probably skip a visit. 
And then I think one of the things we have to talk about is sort of talking about switching back and forth between daily and two on one dosing and making sure our our patients communicate with us that they're doing that just so things aren't surprising when you get a refill request for someone because they've changed back to daily dosing and they need more pills. These are the counseling points from the guidelines. Again, talking about how important it is to take the pre and the post sex doses, particularly the pre sex dosing, using prep for all encounters and not picking based on partner types discussing the possibility of recurrent startup symptoms, which may be an, uh, a reason to do daily dosing because you go through this once. They comment about the possibility that using 2-1-1 dosing may inadvertently disclose same-sex behavior, again, because 2-1-1 has only been studied in cisgender men who have sex with men, and therefore saying, oh, I'm doing 2-1-1 may imply, therefore, that you are a cisgender man who has sex with men. As I mentioned, how to change back and forth between a daily and two on one. And as Hillary pointed out, the first time I did this talk, one, one, one dosing. So it's two, one, one if the last time you've had sex was more than a week ago. But if you have sex twice in the same week, but have that gap, the recommendation is to start with just one pill and not two pills. Again, if the last time uh, you took a pill was in the last week. Continue need for HIV and STI testing, regardless of the frequency of exposures, and then this um, issue that 211 might not be covered by insurance and how you write the prescription is important. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off.